breathing issues because it is a danger in our society. Mm. So silica, silica all by itself. Let's say you want to take some sand and melt it. You're going to have kind of a tough time because it melts at more than 3,000 degrees F. And it's extremely viscous, so it's very hard to mess with if you want to make something out of it. I actually have a client who makes um, quartz glass, and the equipment that they use is mind-boggling and proprietary, but uh, <laughs> but it's really amazing to see that it can be done. Um, Quartz glass has the smallest coefficient of expansion of all of the silicate glass, um, which is cool, but it's primarily for industrial use because it's also expensive. Although we've all seen it in quartz heaters. Mm. A quartz heater uses actual quartz glass in the glass tubing that surrounds the heating elements inside the quartz. So that is pure um, SiO2 inside those tubes. Now, and this is the same thing that they're using on the inside of some of the kilns. Like I know some of the larger kilns yes. will have the quartz tubes. Right. Hmm. Which puts a, a constraint on how hot your kiln can get, but hmm. that's okay. Right. <laughs> Unless you're Kim Brill and trying to, you know, bump your kiln up <laughs> as hot as it can go. Hey. <laughs> oh, no. Um. I put this picture up here because I have a whole bunch of porcelain at home that uh, nobody in the family wants. And I'm like, wow, can I melt it? <laughs> so <clears throat> I, I looked up to see if I could melt it. You can't. It melts at an even higher temperature than quartz. Wow. But I figured I could put that here just to make a point. And besides, I really like this. Uh, her name's Livia Marin, and she makes amazing uh, artwork. That's very cool. So it, you take your silica now and you want to make glass and you can't get your kiln up to 3,000 degrees because um, it'll melt your kiln. So you need to add a flux. Now, flux, I, I'm, I'm older probably than a lot of you guys here, but when I was in seventh grade and my brother was learning how to solder things and what flux was, I was making milk fluff and aprons in home economics. <laughs> so I never learned about what a flux was. Right. In this particular case, um, it's a ceramic flux, and you add in some uh, soda, basically, which is the sodium oxide, and it will cause the silica to melt at a lower temperature, which is convenient. The only th problem with it is if you just make silica soda glass, it's water-soluble. Oh, so oh. whatever you have, it, you're not going to have it for very long. Well, you could. <laughs> you lived in Arizona. Glass. Oh. Wow. So at last, we get to the part where we have um, pa Paul Tarlow's very rhythmic sonata. <laughs> we we bring in lime, which is the stabilizer, and it will move in, and uh, it actually keeps the glass from going back into solution. Um, the combinations on this are limitless. The, there is no recipe exactly. Um, there's, there's a percentage, and you can bury them, the percentages of the silica, soda, and lime to get different characteristics to show up in your glass. And of course, that also varies the characteristics in your glass, which is part of what makes bullseye compatibility so absolutely amazing cool so soda lime glass the most common approximately from what i was reading 90 percent of all the glass that we see is soda lime glass it's the cheapest one to make um, they, they can make window windows bottles light bulbs and our glass it, art glass is also soda lime glass uh, it has a low chemical resistance. That's kind of uh, stretching a point a little. Um, it's lower compared to other types of glass, but it's still more resistant than I am. It does have more of a susceptibility to thermal shock than the other types of glass do, as well as lower durability. 
but it's still pretty amazing and we still have examples of it from 2000 years ago that look pretty good so wow i like oh, it uh rosemary i have a question for you so we found yes. some bottles that look a lot like what you're showing there we found them in new mexico and they almost look like they were iridescent they had some sort of a a film on them that looked like they were iridescent do you know what causes that Oddly enough, I will be discussing that farther in this live Yay! show. I didn't, we didn't even compare notes up front, so that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, let's Ooh. talk about leaded glass. Leaded glass is gorgeous. And it can contain up to 40% lead by weight, Ooh. which just boggles my brain when I'm imagining drinking something out of something that's 40% lead. Modern crystal has to have a minimum of 24%. Oh. And of course, the more, the heavier. Uh, leaded glass is used for numerous things. Um, it's, it has a wonderful brilliance to it. So of course, fine tableware. Mm -hmm. It's very easy apparently to um, melt because it melts at a lower temperature and work. The article that I read said it's used in television tubes. I don't think anybody much younger than I am knows what a television tube is. I do, I do. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Just really a, a television tube? Um, and it can be used for radiation protection. Uh, mm -hmm. It in fact is used commonly in radiation protection. If you lead the glass that you surround your x-rays with, you can still see the patient without dying horribly later. Wow. Issues with leaded glass are it's they're easily scratched and they can leach the lead into whatever you put in them. Uh, it's not really a problem if you're going to, you know, drink a glass of wine or something like that. The problem came in when people were storing their scotch in the leaded crystal scotch dispensers. Oh. Um, if you leave it in there for like two weeks, enough lead will actually leach out that uh, you don't want to drink it. Wow. And this, wow. this was something that people found out by, by measuring the lead concentrations in, it, in the liquor. Interesting. And people were leaving their scotch in their bottles for more than a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of you. Yeah. I'd also heard the Higuchis in their pot de verre. I've heard that they use leaded glass. Really? Is, Interesting. That, I mean, it probably need to verify it, but I had seen that once. I think maybe Linda Ethier had mentioned that. So, like huh. when the tsunami came in and wiped out their stuff, that that was one of the issues, I guess. Wow. Hmm. Well, the lead comes in and it substitutes in for the calcium. Oh. Then we have borosilicate glass or Pyrex. In this case, uh, boron substitutes in for the calcium, and we end up with Pyrex, which has good thermal shock resistance, chemical resistance, and we use it in the kitchen and in the laboratory. Um, I think most everybody is aware now that Pyrex dishes used to be made out of borosilicates, but they're not anymore here in the yeah. United States. They are overseas. Um, and you can still buy borosilicates, but you have to make a concerted effort. <laughs> uh, an issue with borosilicates is if you're working at a high temperature, which is like 900 degrees F, for a long term, uh, it will deteriorate the glass. Hmm. But I don't cook that high. Actually, <laughs> I don't cook, but hey. I don't cook. So... Uh, comparing the glass qualities, I thought this would be kind of interesting. It turned out to be more problematic. You look at the density of, of glass. Uh, quartz is, is 2.65, and then actually the soda lime that we use is lighter, and borosilicates are lighter still. And the, the lead numbers, because it can vary so much, like between 20% to 40% lead, that 3.1 number is just kind of a, let's throw it up in the air because it can go as high as five mm -hmm. uh, relative density. The transition temperature or the temperature at which things start becoming plastic 
are lower for the soda lime than they are for the borosilicate and way lower than they are for the quartz, which is one of the reasons it's more difficult to work with those other two. Coefficient of expansion is fascinating. The soda lime that we work with, which we call 90 COE, mm. um, has a nine. Borosilicates are about a third that, and the quartz glass itself is like a fifteenth of the coefficient of expansion. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. Refractive index uh -huh. just gets better for lead, and I couldn't find one for quartz. But I got the most laps from Google when I tried to get the uh, delta T to fracture. So to lime glass, you can change its temperature instantaneously up to almost 99 degrees at once before it will fracture. Um, Pyrex, on the other hand, has 329 degrees worth of space before it will fracture due to a temperature change, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So that delta is over how long? Kind of instantaneous. Um, is that per second? Almost instantaneous. It's it's you stick it in water, so instantaneous. So hence the reason that your Pyrex, like if you've ever put a glass under hot water and it shattered. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I just ask because that's the the fracturing uh, is like a rate of change thing, and uh, so right. Obviously, we can get glass much much hotter than ninety nine degrees. Fahrenheit, uh, <laughs> because we do it slower. Oh. I was wondering what the no, delta sorry. T was relative to. Uh -huh. Oh, this is a delta T of 99 degrees. So if your glass is 120 degrees right now and you suddenly raise it to 130 degrees, it won't fracture until it gets to 129 degrees. Okay. It just seems like there, that needs to be a rate of change ah. uh, value. I just don't know what the denominator yeah. is. <laughs> no, this isn't a rate of change. This is a a change in the temperature required to make the glass fracture. Interesting. Hmm. Very inter oh, and I do know another use of borosilicate too. So a lot of the lamp work, especially, and I hate to bring it up, but when we lived in Colorado, they made a lot of um, pipes, for example, out of right. glass, and they had to use borosilicate because they were heating it up. So I yep. that was really interesting. And in fact, there are states that have programs in place to go out and grab crack pipes and replace them with borosilicate crack pipes because <laughs> the users were fracturing the, the cheaper ones and getting cut, and then they would pass around whatever disease was most convenient. Oh, at the time. wow. Wow. So there, there are actually government-published brochures on that. Wow. Which I would never have known about. Interesting. Uh, so now let's talk about glass disease. <laughs> this is, is fascinating to me because I'd never heard the word chrysling until I spent some time at uh, uh oh, the Museum of Glass up in New York. Corning. 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 <laughs> Crizzle is just a word I had used to describe myself on days that I felt that way. And apparently it's a real word. So how cool is that? But anyway, I, I always just thought, look, have you ever noticed how some people in the museum just can't keep their glass clean? Right. <laughs> and it, it looks like some, some displays are dirty and some aren't. Or some of them look like glasses that come out of the dishwasher. It turns out that's actually um, a glass disease. So oh, I've never it, heard uh, of that. It turns out that glass isn't inert. And this, this actually comes from alkali on the glass surface. Uh, it, the molecules will come to the surface and they're hygroscopic. So water will be attracted to it, and you can see like little weeping forming on the surface. And you can see this in museums. It's it's not happened at my house, but you know you never know. But tiny droplets and sometimes uh, fine crystals can form, and the glass will feel slimy. Interesting. But you can wash it right off, and then everybody's happy. Um, there's a really good article um, at the Corning Museum on this. So then this was taken from that. Cool.
stage two uh, is a little different. Well, it's more of the first, but it can also, this, this shows the neck of a bottle on display there and teeny tiny crystals are forming in the neck oh, of the wow. bottle. And this is just crystallization of uh, potassium that's coming up out of the glass. Um, in this case, we know that it's stage two because you can wash it all you want. It doesn't really change anything. Um, you can see small cracks that you can't see it on this picture, but it may have small cracks. There's small cracks on this picture. Mm -hmm. Stage three is when small cracks appear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this happens all by itself. It's oh, not, uh, you know, the, the piece of glass is sitting on the shelf in the museum being observed, but not touched. Interesting. Uh, then this crackling can be very uniform um, and visible. And hey, that's stage four. Yeah. About how much time is necessary for between these stages? It's highly variable and it depends on the composition of the glass. If there's not enough of the stabilizer in it, you know, if you haven't added in enough of the calcium, then the it's more soluble, so it can happen faster. And it can happen as fast as a year. And then we also have samples of glass from um, the Egyptian time where it hasn't happened. So it, it's all depending on, you know, how it was made. And you can see this when you go to a museum because you'll go from case to case and one case can be filled with it and another case won't. And it's not like uh, glass disease is communicable. It's that they tend to display things together that belong together. Oh. So it just has to do with the chemical makeup of the glass for why some do and some don't, given exactly. what amount of time. Cool. Uh, stage four, the cracking gets deeper. In this particular case, um, you can see where uh, bits of glass have spalled off. There is a pattern in there, but there's also just a lot of small chips coming off the surface, which is very sad. Wow. And the last phase, which is, oh. <laughs> it, it actually just falls apart, stage five. Oh. Um, and you don't have to do anything to get it to do that. It'll just lose its structural integrity and then perhaps a, a curator can pick it up to do something and it'll fall apart. Or it can separate into fragments without anything. It'll just fall apart one day. Wow. Now the 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 glass halo color falls into this uh, category of things as well, except that it's brought on by the sun. So if you were to look at it under a scanning electron microscope, you would see teeny tiny crystals that would reflect um, whatever element was in it, which is why glass sun changes to different colors depending on what metal is used in it as the stabilizer. And oh. that does it. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Very cool. That is pretty cool. I remember when you did this one. Yeah, I didn't actually. Paul did this. Oh, There's... that's right. I remember, but it has that little tiny crack through it. <laughs> yeah, very sad. Yeah, that's very cool. I had some questions. Anybody have any questions? Oh, and I muted. I muted everybody. So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself to ask because I just did it because there was some feedback. Um, but if you have a question, anybody got questions? I have a question. Yeah. Rosemary, you've been to the Corning Museum? I have. Um, do you remember a display that is a very large tower where they put Corning ware on it? Yes. <laughs> So can you can you talk about how it changed from ceramic? So so there's this law that's very tall wire form that is hollow, and around the form they put corningware, and it starts out as glass at the bottom, and then the temperature changes. The next row is pots, 
that are a little bit lighter and then lighter. And so basically you see the progression from glass to ceramic on this tower with Corningware. And it's the most amazing thing. And I don't understand how ceramic becomes glass or vice versa. Me neither. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good. I thought it was just me. Uh, <laughs> no. Sweet. Kim, that's your fusing Friday two weeks from now. That's right. <laughs> I think so. Good. I know who to call on that. Right? I do. Oh. That is really Although, really now I want to find out. <laughs> I know, right? Quick, we got to Google it. Because I think everybody has cornyware in their kitchen. Yeah. Um, but yeah. for a while, you know, like in the 70s or 80s, they actually made glass frying pans that were not a great product. I have one. I gave it away. <laughs> and so now, you know, I think the corning line of, uh, of products is the ceramic again. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a magical material that goes from ceramic to glass or the other way around. I'm not sure. You know, I, I wonder, too. Oh, go ahead. There's also a, a wonderful display on, it's on their webpage. I didn't see it at, at the museum, where a professor of material science wrote a recipe for making fudge in terms of uh, making glass. I'm talking about glass transition and how you're mixing different types of materials together, which may or may not be compatible. It's pretty funny reading. I recommend searching around for it. I'm looking for it now, right now, but uh, we'll have to put that up. Oh, another interesting trivia. Did you ever hear how, how they ended up making borosilicate or the Pyrex dishes? Did you ever hear that? That apparently, I read this on, on a site, I guess they said that uh, the rain, whenever it hit the globes on the, on the railroad, that it would actually shatter the glass globes. And so they started trying to make lantern, I guess, uh, globes for, for the railway, but that the guy brought it home and his wife like baked a cake in it. And that's how they <laughs> were out that they could actually, that they could use it for baking. But I guess he had kind of a jar of it and she baked a cake in it. But, isn't that <laughs> wow. weird? I'd have to verify it, but I think that, that uh, it, it came from a historical site. Right. Yeah. That's very cool. It's the most amazing material, isn't it? It really is. I love yeah. this stuff. Yeah. I just, yeah, just melting stuff. <laughs> As we always talk about, it's like a, you know, started melting stuff as a kid. It's like if you can put plastic beads in an easy bake oven and make a sun catcher, it's like, uh, you know, it's a lifelong habit. Can't break. <laughs> Do you remember Tricky Dinks? That was almost like glass. Oh, my God. Yeah. In fact, I saw a tutorial, a jewelry tutorial last week that was using Shrinky Dinks to make jewelry. It was, you would cut out your design and then set it in like sterling silver. So it's, Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I thought I could take that class. In fact, that would that shrinky dinks actually be a glass, Rosemary, under that definition? I don't know what a shrinky dink is. Oh, no! <laughs> it was sheets of plastic that you could actually color with pencils or permanent markers. You know what? I have one in my closet somewhere. Of course you do. I do. I made a <laughs> for my father when I was a kid. You guys talk about Oh, what? Kenna, Kenna has an explanation of what a shrinky dink is. <laughs> oh, good. Go for it. She's Go, a Kenna. material science student, actually. Sweet. And an Aggie. Let's hear it. Yeah. So it's not a glass. What shrinky dink basically is, is it's a polymer, like, um, it's a, uh, it's a thermal, no, <laughs> memory polymer. That's the word. Um, so you, like, it is a polymer that's basically been made and then they stretch it. And so it's like as if you were holding hands with someone and you pulled really, really far apart. And then as soon as you heat it up to the proper temperature, they can move, the atoms can move then, and then they shrink back together. To their so, normal size. Yeah. So it, it has a structure and is therefore not a glass. So, so being, being a guy, I'd, I'd like to make a pitch for using uh, children's toys for glass art. Right? Uh-oh, we have a yeah. feedback. About the feedback. Paul, Paul and I used spin art one night. I've, Karen, can you turn off your sound while Manny's talking? It's feeding back from your computer. Oh, oh the sound is, okay. 
<laughs> there we go. All right, I, I, what I said is being a guy, I'm all in favor of combining toys with glass art. And Paul <laughs> and I, I actually brought spin art toy up to the studio one night. Paul and I did spin art. So if you can figure shrinky dinks in glass, I mean, hey. Hey. Nasty, yeah. Nasty big ovens in glass. I'm totally behind all of this. <laughs> I can't believe you took a spin art to the studio and you didn't call me. Right? I'm sorry. I'll bring it in. <laughs> freeze and fuse this. Freeze and fuse this kind of a shrinky dink. Well, it is kind of. And so, in fact, that's how you did your alien game one, right? Right. Rosemary? Yeah. yeah. She did freeze and fuse little aliens. That what was that game? What did they call that game? Space invaders. Space invaders. It was stunning. So, what I did is I was looking for my shrinky dinks. I don't know if y'all can see it. So, oh, you can't probably. <laughs> it's, it's, it's green. There it is. Anyway. Pat, I have some at home. I can share them with you. What? Oh, Shrinky Dinks? Yes. I love of it. Of course you do. Of course. Elena, I love that. I love Shrinky Dinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found this thing. I made my dad a, this, since Father's Day is coming up, it's actually resin with um, some Sculpey, and I made some cactuses, and it says Dad on it. So I made him a paperweight for, uh, for Father's Day once. But that's resin. Not quite glass. That counts. Hey, Rosemary, no, what glass. are some other examples of glass that occur naturally? Like you said, the salt domes and the ones that erupt, but I know there are other forms of it. Ooh. Yeah, like fulgurites, which What's is fulgurite? the glass that, that's what forms when the lightning strikes the yes. sand in the desert. Um, man. I like that one. What is it? Fulgurite? Fulgurite, yeah. Fulgurite, there it is. And Ooh. then there are tektites, which uh, are splashed rock after it's been hit with a meteor. I have no idea how you actually know when you've found one of those, because they're also volcanic bombs, and those are just pieces of glass that the volcano has spit out. Oh, wow. What? These how about that glass coral? There's a glass coral. Oh, yeah, the glass sponge. It's a glass right. sponge. Yeah, they, they make uh, their endoskeletons out of the silica. Mm -hmm. That one's pretty cool. Hold on, I'm bringing one up right now. Here it is. I'll share the screen. If anybody... Didn't you talk about your mom having a sample of this cat? Yeah, I've got one, and it has a shrimp in it, actually. So Cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Okay, I've got a screen here. So here's that sponge. Actually, my mom's looks a lot like this. So, but you can see where it has this mesh in there. But hers actually has a little shrimp that died and, and is, you know, kind of encased in it, which is pretty cool. And then I had also had, oh, can you guys see that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then there's this one. I found these were the fulgurites, I guess, the, uh, the ones that go through, through the sand. No, fulgurites are formed by uh, lightning. lightning. Yeah. And they don't look this elegant. <laughs> they're, they're not living. No, no. This, uh, I found like these guys right here. That's what I've seen with it before. Cool. Yeah. I think we're still seeing the coral. Yeah, we're not, seeing, we're not seeing fulgurites. Gotcha. I thought I shared the whole screen. There we go. Got it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Because it's like this one's definitely, that's definitely not one. <laughs> right. It's not, no, it says it is. Petrified lightning is. It says what, it is, but I don't think so. No, that looks too weird. There's an interesting one. Wow. It's cool stuff, though. Amazing. Right? Who knew? But is obs obsidian the only glass rock? That's a good question. Uh, is quartz considered rocks... glass? No, because it's crystal. okay. Quartz is a crystal. Okay. Yeah, those are very cool. Very cool. So, any other questions? No. Nobody's raised their hands. Let me see. We've got twenty-four folks here right now, too. So, Rosemary, years ago, I bought Karen a piece of glass that was Roman, a piece of jewelry is Roman glass. What? Were you asked, no, it wasn't pink. Um, <laughs> what did they do differently back then? 
They did their glass work over a campfire. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But basically, uh, they just didn't have the, the same kind of quality control we do. It's amazing to me that they ever got any of it to work. Right? Hold on, I have, let me get it real quick. We just happen to have some samples up here. Here we go. Of course, some of these may be, oh, in fact, here's one. We were talking about that iridescence. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wait, so is that iridescence chrysling? Yeah. The kind of, well, the chrysling part is, is the, um, are the cracks. Gotcha. And apparently people can get crizzled if you get like dry skin cracks on the back of your hand. I didn't realize that. I apparently <laughs> I really am crizzled. But right? I think I feel crizzled. Yeah, these I mean I don't it says it's ancient Roman glass. I'm not sure if that's actually I never know. One of the things we found when my folks lived in the Middle East is they would take something that you thought was old and ancient. But what they were doing is they were making new stuff and back in the back room, they were like beating it with a hammer and <laughs> making it look old and then they would sell it to the tourists. So. If you're ever in Southern California, go to the Getty Villa. They have a huge collection of ancient glass. Do they? Yeah, and it looks a lot like the pictures you're showing. It's, it's unbelievable the minute detail they can get with no tools. <laughs> it's really? Compared to us, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was looking. Is that it? Nope, not that. Trying to find some samples of it. I can't see it. Oh, here's an interesting one, though. Oh, here's one. Let me look another one. Khan Academy. You guys ever heard of Khan Academy? Mm -mm. Khan Academy is pretty cool. This actually just showed up from Khan Academy, which it's actually a learning platform. So if you it started out with this guy who was trying to help, I think his niece or something with her homework. And he came up with this, this way of teaching that was on like a whiteboard, a virtual whiteboard on the computer. So what it is, is it's basically branded as this, this um, platform where you can learn anything for free. And anyway, this just showed up. It shows as being on Cat Khan Academy oh. site, but it's an ancient glass at the Getty, um, at the Getty, cool. I guess. So almost looks like cameo. Oh, it's not going to show you guys. Just the one over to the left looks really cool how they're blended. Which one is it? The yeah. down to your left. That one right that there. One. Yeah. Ooh, that's pretty. That is pretty. Oh, here's some interesting ones too. Some little vessels. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is neat. Let me see. And there's also Eisen glass. How do you spell that? Which is. <laughs> Wow, I S E N, I think. There it is, Isenglass. Yeah, E I, okay. And it's mica. They used to make windows out of large sheets of mica. Really? Oops, Oops. I think this isn't quite I, the right one, but. No, I think that's man made. But, <laughs> uh, I think I, I'd one. only seen the mica that had really small, cute crystals. And then the first time I saw large chunks of mica in a museum, it was yeah. it was amazing, but they used to use them for windows. See, that's interesting. You know, another interesting thing too is if uh, if you're enameling, there's a technique called plicajour. Let me find it real quick. It's there. It is. Anyway, it's a type of glass that is fired in a frame, so it looks something like this. Basically, like oh, like fake stained glass. Exactly. But the thing is, is that in traditional plique jour, they actually make this out of wire, like fine silver wire. And then they take crushed glass, basically like powder, uh, mix it with a, you know, some sort of a maybe gum Arabic or something. And then they put it in these cells and they fire it over and over. And then they polish it. They essentially cold work the outside of it. So That's awesome. Yeah, but a lot of times if you're doing something flat in plique jour like this, you're firing it on a piece of mica is what this one wow. is. But they would make really intricate things like, you know, dragonflies and such, but that's all glass, but it's put into this framework um, that, oh, in fact, this one right here, interestingly, I found this, this person a while back. This is a cup that was actually made out of 3D printing 
and then you can see the technique here. So they're mixing the glass powder with, with a tool, you know, in, in this liquid and basically filling the cells. They'll fire it and they keep repeating that over and over again. Wow. Yeah. But what you end up with is stuff like that. Oh my gosh. I know, right? Uh -oh. What's the metal? Uh, it's usually fine silver because um, sterling silver will, will oxidize. And when it oxidizes, it turns black and it can affect the colors. But uh, when you're enameling, you have, to, you have to be careful about what's your base metal because it can actually change the colors of things. It'll mm -hmm. react. The chemicals in there will actually react. But I read somewhere if I fired silver in my kiln, I might it might wear off on the next piece of glass I put in. Is that yeah. true? I yes. have heard that, but you know what? Yeah. I, I've seen I, it. I have uh -oh. one kiln that I actually enamel. I do enameling. I do burnout. I do PMC, the precious metal clay. I've never had a problem in it. So it, you know, I don't know if there's a certain situation that it happens, but with me in mine, I've never had a problem with it. I mean, had to stain the shelf. What's that? You have to, you have to keep a, a silver dedicated shelf because it will stain the shelf, and then that stain can move on to another piece. Yeah, I could see that. Kat, did you say that the, this technique is three mm -hmm. D printed? This one woman, this Amy Roper Lyons. So the stuff that she's doing, she is actually three D printing that and then casting it in silver to be able to do this kind of thing, but this actually almost looks like that would be the the printed base for it oh got it okay yeah but whenever you're so if you guys are familiar with something like lost wax casting if you, yeah. you take your model and it's wax and then you embed it in plaster and then you burn out the wax and what's left is a cavity that essentially is then filled with metal got and it so in the 3d printing you're essentially doing the same thing but you're using resin instead of wax got it so but that's how she's making these designs, which in a lot of cases would be really hard to do if you were trying to fabricate it. But her stuff is just stunning. This looks like Pat Devere meets stained glass <laughs> on steroids. Yes. Kind of does. Yeah. yeah. In fact, an interesting thing on this, if you were doing this technique, you're, um, you're washing your powders and your enamels to get that optimal clarity. You want the largest grain size that you can have, and then you also wash it to get all of the fine uh, powder out of it so it's, it's not cloudy. Like pot de verre is cloudy because it actually has little fines in it and it gets little tiny bubbles. That's what makes it not clear and transparent. It gives it kind of that cloudy luminescence, I guess. So. Am I the only one who washes their frit? No, yes. I do it. <laughs> Wait, no, Stephanie does it? <laughs> I, I wash mine too. Kim, I've done it. Yeah, Kim, I have washed powder. Yeah, you have washed powder. <laughs> I I have I washed, haven't done that. I've washed red specifically in order to do um, uh, freeze infuse with it, so that I wouldn't get livery spots on the surface. Interesting. What's a livery spot, Stephanie? I'm not familiar with that. You do you use much red? Uh, no, no, I don't. It, it, it's it's what happens to red all the time when you fire. Yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. When you wash it, are you just like rinsing it in regular water? Yeah, I basically um, mix in water and then I it the water will turn cloudy. I let it settle and then I drain the cloudy water off. Yeah. And I do that a couple of times. Um, Let's see. But yes, I wash like when I did, um, I don't know if y'all remember, I did like 50 paperweights for my wedding. I yes. remember. And yeah. I used coarse for, for those so that I got more clarity. And I washed all of that fret. Interesting. <laughs> I washed coarse, cor, coarse fret. But Stephanie, yeah. how do, wh what do you do? What do you do with the powder? How do you get it back to powder form? Will you just like you dry, dry it out? It dries out. Yeah, I dry it out. And I was going to show you if you guys can see this screen. So I did a tutorial when I worked for Wubbers which talked about how to wash and, and even like sifting them through a screen, but basically putting some water there. So it's like taking your enamels or powders, it works the same with glass, and you would mix it with some water, swish it around, and then pour off the fines. The cloudy water actually is the fines. Um, you wash it several times, and then always on the last one, I would wash it using uh, distilled water, just to make sure that you didn't have anything in there. 
and then I would put it out on a coffee filter. So see, I've poured it out here. If you can see that, that's a little coffee filter, poured it out there and then just let it dry and then put it back into a container. Hmm. Or I used a dehydrator, which I had in Colorado and <laughs> I put it on Craigslist and some kids came up and, and tumbled out of a car and wanted to buy it from me at like nine o'clock at night. I later figured out what they were using it for. <laughs> so. Did you serve a dehydrator? Yeah. They were dehydrating things, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite what you were using it for. <laughs> I had decided I was going to sell everything and move to the Caribbean. So I was getting rid of everything, but that didn't wow. happen. So, but you can see here, once it dries in Denver, it dries in about three minutes flat, but in Texas, it takes about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you could put it in an oven at a low temperature and actually dry it out and then store it in these cups and write washed on it. But, but if you've ever taken any of the, the casting classes, if you were casting with coarse frit, coarse frit is going to be much more transparent than if you use like powders or even fine frit. Yeah. So, because it traps those little tiny bubbles in there. And whether it's a transparent powder or an opal powder, it's all going to be um, it's all going to be opaque or translucent, depending on what it is. And that's what the billets are for. I mean, yeah. 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 That's yeah. the whole reason they make them. Exactly. Because there's no bubbles in it and that's going to get you optimal clarity. So, so, so Rosemary, here's a question. Um, we went to Boston for a recreational weekend a few years ago and we heard people talking about gl glass panes in old mullioned windows and the original glass panes over a couple of hundred years have all gone from clear to a very, very, very dark purple. And they are so valued and so coveted that Lloyd's of London insures these glass panes. Do you know anything about why that color would change? Seriously. Uh-huh. It's probably the same reason that a, a lot of the, um, the ship's lights, you know, that they sell them, they look like, prisms that they used yeah. to embed in floors of ships uh -huh. and those will change colors and again it, it's based on what the metal is that's in the glass right and it, it will oxidize with the sun right that's crazy but if but if it happened indoors i don't know yeah i would love to have seen from the inside of the house what that purple looked like because from the outside they were just dark 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 and you couldn't see a thing um but yeah. ev evidently very valuable very coveted, very, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> you know, another interesting thing on that, Kim, that you mentioned is because when we were in Seattle, they had glass, they were like mosaic glass things on the streets. That yes. I think, I bet they were dark purple. They, they were prisons. Yeah. yeah. They Those were prisons, the prisons like I was talking about. Interesting. Yeah. They're I like, they okay. used to build those into the decks of ships to light the galley slaves' um, quarters. Seriously? Yeah. Seriously. And Seattle has a whole underground. Um, right. Because it was a sink, sinking yeah. city. And, and they were purple. They were all kinds of purples, right? They went from lavender to all the way to deep, deep purple. I may have a picture yeah. there. I'm actually looking right now. Because as we were walking, to, yep, got it. Ready? Woohoo! Yes. Technology. <laughs> okay, I'm airdropping it to my computer. Here it comes. Yay. Got it. Okay. There it goes. That's it from Seattle. Cool. Seen that in a couple of cities, but they're not that's not real common. Yeah. So is it, are there tunnels underneath this? Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a whole underground city tour in Seattle that you can take. Right. And so this is how they illuminate those tunnels? May have been. I, I guess I assumed this was always purple, but. No, it started out clear. That's so strange. And the tunnels aren't occupied anymore, but they were. Really more. Well, they were, I think, bordellos and a few <laughs> other things. but. Right. Um, so is this translucent? Does it, does it let light in? 
It's a good Probably question. let more light in when they were still clear. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. You can see through them still, yeah. I took the tour, but, and I don't remember seeing those with light coming down into yeah. the tunnels. Hmm. Yeah, I just always assumed that they were they were always purple. That's interesting. I learned something. <laughs> cool. So anyway, oh. so anybody have big plans this weekend? Anybody doing anything fun? Working on projects? Hey, Kat, can I read something that I found for Kim about purple glass really quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. I hear somebody. We have to unmute. Elena? So. Elena, are you there? Yes, I have to unmute, but there's a lot going on at my house, so it's <laughs> noisy. <laughs> Got it. Okay, I'm going to try again. Hold on. Okay. Uh-oh. Sun purple? No? It keeps scrolling away from me, so I'm having oh. trouble. I'm having trouble. Ah, that's just me now making lots of beeps. Hold on one second. I'm just going to adjust my screen. Um, all right. It says it's a photochemical. It says it's a photochemical phenomenon that's not perfectly understood. It's generally accepted that ultraviolet light initiates an electron exchange between the manganese and iron ions. The changes, um, this changes the manganese compound into a form that causes the glass to turn purple. Wow. Does that make any cool. sense? Do you think that might be something about purple glass, Kim? Can Kenna explain that? No, I don't know. <laughs> She's got a blank look on her face, but I'll <laughs> We're going to have to make her a guest presenter one of these Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's fun. It's you know, I the chemical structure of it, but there's not really enough information. I, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> We're counting on you. No pressure whatsoever. Oh, no. Lots of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So that's cool. Anybody working on anything fun? Any funny, fun projects? Nobody? Anybody working on glass or are we all learning interesting quarantine things like, you know, Karen baking bread? I've seen my, my, kiln, my kiln is under repair, so no glass for a while. Oh no. Oh no. So yeah, what's wrong with it? Right now. I have the bread in the oh. oven as we speak. Oh man. Oh wow. And the house smells like cinnamon. It's a cinnamon. Uh. Right oh. It will be out in a few. Oh. I can be there in 10 minutes. I know, right? <laughs> How can anyone beat that? No one can beat that. No. Uh, Lori's got a couple of um, spinning cake decorating plates that she's playing with enamels with. It's basically a spirograph. Cool. That's awesome. Karen, Karen, I did dirty pours. What's that, Manny? Karen, I did, I did dirty pours using the big mouth uh, glass, uh, glass, glass and Come out, Manny. Yeah, Did they look like the marbling you were going for. <laughs> we all laid on that one. Elena told me about it, and I ordered it. <laughs> oh, you ordered the big mouth stuff? Yes, and Manny and I did pours. What'd you think? Cool. We were really happy. Yeah, it's really fun. It's fun to do. I really enjoy it. Oh my god! Yeah, I can't wait to see. Cool. Um. I've made toffee. It's not glass related, but I've made I've <laughs> made it four times, and two times it turned out, and two times it didn't. Wait, wait is toffee a glass? Yeah, it is a glass. So that counts, <laughs> right? Oh man! I also I, have a blueberry pie that came out of the oven about an hour ago. Uh, party! At, I'm moving yeah. in with you. Right? Oh my god! Yeah, this whole sugar, cooking sugar everyday cake. thing is weird. Yeah, I, I'm well, the fact that you've got 50% success is pretty remarkable. I used to make 12 pancakes and pick the best three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I yeah, like my that. dad just used to make one and filled the whole pan. He didn't have the patience for the rest. Yeah. 
Oh, although I did watch, so somebody had suggested that show, um, Nailed It, I guess that Netflix show where they, they cook something. It's like, we've got this professional, um, uh, like dessert. And one of them was like Shakespeare cookies with like a, it had a stained glass window made out of Jolly Rancher candies. <laughs> I was thinking it was kind of like fusing and food all together. <laughs> <laughs> when I was little, we used to make stained glass window cookies at Christmas and Did use um, clear lifesavers. Lifesavers. Yeah. That's oh, what I, yeah. I always wanted to do that. And I, I've, yeah, I was kind of inspired for about three hours and then I, I moved on to the next squirrel event in my life. So, but we did have a scary glass related thing happen today, though. I, Bobby was in his office and I heard a crashing sound, a glass crashing sound. And you guys know the sound. It kind of strikes fear. His, the globe on his ceiling fan fell off and onto his desk. So, wow. And what was weird, though, is last night I had a dream about making blades for a ceiling fan out of glass. <laughs> wow. Did it shatter? Let's not do that. Yeah, it completely shattered. The dogs were in there, and it was everywhere in his office. But it just, I guess, uh, came oh, speaking of dogs, let me mute. Oh, man. But, but that was a little, a little nerve wracking. But it was weird. I had that dream last night because we installed two ceiling fans yesterday. I thought, how cool would that be to cast the blades in glass? You so. say that, and I had visions of a Sylvia Levinson piece out of Erbium Pink on Ooh. a boat. <laughs> right? so, so would it be better if you tempered it or annealed it? <laughs> oh yeah uh, rosemary any thoughts <laughs> i have visions of them flying off and decapitating your visitors yes yes depends on so if you I didn't try the mobiles i'd look at I was really envious uh, of metal ones and was thinking if i could make you know blades to catch the wind oh that, well, that answer that actually answers the question if if you're worried about when they break you temper it because then it won't be big pieces flying off. You'll get lots and lots and lots of little tiny ones, which is a bit safer than a giant piece of glass. Oh, coming. definitely. Be like a snowstorm of glass. But like, you ever seen a car window shatter? Yes. Right. Yeah, that's tempered glass shattering. And then you take it and you put it in a fire pit and you make like a nice little glass fire pit in your yard. What so. exactly is tempering? How is it different from annealing? Um, it's actually the exact opposite of annealing. Is um, it? Instead of letting the uh, glass kind of even out, what you're doing is you're cooling at a fairly rapid rate so, that all, rate so that the pressures are either all towards the inside or all towards the outside. I can't remember which direction it is. Um, but it creates this compressive force on the glass as it's cooling. And the compression actually is what makes it strong. It's similar to when you bow something in construction, that bowing that you give to it actually provides strength. Yeah. Um, if you want to see something really awesome, uh, it's actually been shown at the studio a bunch of times, but look up Smarter Every Day, oh, uh, yeah. Prince Rupert's Drops, and he okay. talks about the whole process and what's going on with them and why they're so strong. It's the same idea as tempering. He's going to make an appearance at Fusing Friday as soon as we figure out some technical details. Absolutely. Kim and I are going to arm wrestle for him because he's super yeah. cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah we, we have to break the bad news to larry and bobby but uh, uh you know they, they're grown men they can handle it <laughs> they'll just have to get over it they will i know yeah it's like when you take that that list of 10 people you'd like to sit down and have a beer with he's on my list <laughs> yeah so uh, he's he's fun he's, he's done some great videos i've learned a lot laminar flow i think is the last one i saw but i haven't seen that one it's actually pretty good so anyway, my gosh, we're actually, we are kind of done earlier tonight. That's amazing. I know. It's because we had direction and focus. It's something that we're not good at. But <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Rosemary. So thank you very much. Yeah. So you, you know what else, guys, is we are looking for other ideas for other Fusing Fridays. So if anything occurs to you that you would like to explore, talk about, present, um, we're all ears. Just let us know. And other people, if there's somebody yeah. that uh, we could invite in for, a, for a, I guess, a, a session on a Friday, that would be good as well. 
wait a minute. I just missed the Friday fusing. <laughs> <laughs> I've already missed it. Oh, we still hang out. <laughs> oh, we okay. recorded. I well, did. Yeah, I mean, I'm on the Pacific Coast, and it said it sounded like it was six o'clock our time. So, what time do you really start? Seven o'clock Central. Seven o'clock Central. Yeah, that's five. We did record it, so I've got most of, okay, this is where Kat says, I'm a bad person who forgot to record the first part of it, but I got most of it. Okay. So we might have to get Rosemary to talk. How do we listen to the recording? Um, How do we listen? What I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll upload it, and then we'll put a link up on the Fusing Friday Facebook page. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So...